Sustainable solutions can be found at the intersection of science, economics, and social equality, with education also playing an important role. There's little doubt that climate change uh, is our largest and most daunting uh, sustainability challenge. We have structured our symposium around three key themes. Today, leading by example, Hofstra's role in building a sustainable tomorrow. Wednesday is devoted to addressing and adapting to climate change. And finally, on Thursday, we will conclude with local initiatives, Hofstra's role in supporting sustainable communities. I encourage you to consult the symposium program online and to attend as many sessions as you can. And we have, for those of you who are here, we have these fabulous um, uh, guides for all the different um, programs uh, for the rest of the week. Today's panel, uh, Sustaining Community Health, Services and research will provide a model for of the actual and potential role of a, a university in providing otherwise unavailable services to local community members. But let's start this presentation by taking a, a little trip down memory lane. In May, on May 19, 1991, in uh, Newsday's uh, edition, they published this brief mention: a new community services center will be dedicated Thursday at Hofstra. The Joan and Arnold Saltzman Community Services Center houses counseling offices, classrooms, and a nursery. Childcare, early education programs, and clinical services will be offered. For over 30 years, the Saltzman Community Services Center has provided resources for our local community members, students, and Hofstra employees by bringing together five organizations, the Diane Linder Goldberg Child Care Institute, the Counseling and Mental Health Professions Clinic, the Psycho Psychological Evaluation Research and Counseling Clinic, the Reading and Writing Learning Clinic, and the Speech Language Hearing Clinic, all under one roof. The Saltzman Center's mission is to educate Hofstra students and to provide services in support of the health and well being of the community. Clients benefit from a cross disciplinary and complementary model of care at reduced rates. Uh, and the graduate students um, in counseling, psychology, speech, language, and hearing sciences benefit from clinical experience under close supervision of skilled professionals. The Saltzman Community Services Center has been a model of academic community partnership for three decades, a true representation of sustainability. Sustainable partnerships between academic institutions and their local communities also are at the core of another approach to health, public health. In 2020 and 2021, COVID testing and vaccines were successfully implemented by health systems in places of highest need through local community outreach and distribution. And back in 2012, as a brand new assistant professor in public health at Hofstra, I stumbled across a real case of environmental injustice in the nearby hamlet of Roosevelt. Alongside the community-based organization Choice for All, we were able to use public health research and advocacy to get a contaminated Superfund site cleaned and remediated. This academic community partnership is still going strong, and later you'll hear the story about how maintaining and supporting off-campus community relationships continues to be mutually beneficial. So today you'll also hear the story of best practices and hard lessons learned of how to collaborate with school systems social service agencies, and local churches, and how to sustain those relationships. It's now my pleasure to introduce our accomplished panelists who are sitting here. And so the way that this is going to work is that we will have two presentations. Uh, the screen will come up, and then we will all come up, and then two other panelists will um, present. First, we have Wendy Silverman, who is joined the staff of Hofstra's Speech, Language, and Hearing Sciences Department as a clinical director in 2002. She's also an adjunct ass assistant professor. She's a practicing speech language pathologist and clinical supervisor, where she cultivates her interest in neuro rehabilitation and interprofessional education. Michelle Marks is the director of the Reading Writing Learning Clinic at the Saltzman Community Services Center and an adjunct professor in literacy studies at the School of Education. The Reading Writing Learning Clinic is dedicated to providing literacy support to children, adolescents, and adults by state certified literacy specialists who provide weekly small group or individual instruction in an environment where learners have the safety and support to learn. 
Teresa Grella Hillenbrand is the Director of Counseling and Mental Health Professions Clinic at the Saltzman Community Services Center. Teresa is a New York State licensed marriage and family therapist and a clinical member of the American Association for Marriage and Family Therapy and also has a private practice. Teresa is an adjunct instructor in Hofstra's Marriage and Family Therapy graduate program. And finally, Sarah Morrison is a senior parent leader and co-chair of the Parent Action Council of Choice for All, a nonprofit organization located in Roosevelt. Sarah is an extremely active parent advocate within her community, driven by the love of her children, ages 31 to 7. Sarah is also a member of the Family Partner Engagement Task Force with the U.S. Department of Education and serves on the board of directors of the Nassau, Com Nassau Community College's alumni chapter and the Child Care Council of Nassau. And Sarah is also an alum of Hofstra University. So here is our run of show for today. Um, first, Wendy is going to present a snapshot of the work that the Speech Language Hearing Clinic um, has done and what, um, the, what has been gained and learned by students and community members over those years. Then I will present um, a timeline of the activities um, of that super fun site that I mentioned to you in Roosevelt. Uh, and then Sarah is going to take over and uh, talk about current and planned activities for environmental justice in Roosevelt. And finally, I will engage uh, Michelle and Teresa in a conversation to dig deeper uh, into the lessons learned from bringing students and community members together. So without any further ado, let me, like I said, fumble around here, do my thing, and then I'm going to ask Wendy to come up and we'll switch places. everybody. Thanks for coming today. Uh, our executive director, uh, Dr. Joseph Scardapane, is here today, and he's with me some statistics to tell you. Hello, Joe. Thank you. Um, in the 2021-22 academic year, the Joan and Arnold Saltzman Community Services Center was involved in clinical training of over 250 doctoral and master's level students with 10 academic disciplines. Student clinicians provided over 13,000 hours of service and to 1,700 members of our growing community, both in telehealth and in-person sessions. So um, it's a really, really busy and enriching place. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what the speech language hearing clinic has been doing over the last two decades since I've been there, um, specifically um, uh, paying attention to community service. Um, so our graduate students um, provide community service and gain their clinical hours in their first year of training in the Saltzman Center. Um, so they, we see community clients uh, across age span and diagnosis span um, throughout the speech language hearing um, milieu. Um, but we have uh, specialty clinics which reach out into the community and provide broader range and more experience for our graduate students. So I'm going to start with so we've done work uh, right next door at the California Avenue Elementary School. It started out as a very, very small program in one classroom and grew over the years to um, work in five or six kindergarten classes. Um, the graduate students and supervisors would go over to California Avenue twice a week to provide uh, opportunity for language literacy and articulation, training for monolingual and bilingual kindergartners, um, uh, who were high risk for developing language literacy disorders. And um, we also provided articulation therapy um, for monolingual and bilingual kindergartners um, in the district. Um, it was a very, very popular program. It was deeply appreciated by the parents, by the staff of California Avenue. Um, we had a lot of um, support from the administration um, then 2020 hit, um, and we didn't go back to California Avenue yet. Um, they're still recovering a bit. Um, I have a graduate student there doing uh, an externship, so we're beginning to explore returning. 
Okay, we, um, we've uh, partnered with Nassau County um, Early Intervention Program. Um, we provide um, service to toddlers, um, which are returned 100% face-to-face, but uh, the last two years we've been online. Um, so we do activities to foster vocabulary and social communication skills in children, one-to-one -one parent coaching to teach language facilitation strategies to achieve child's individual language and communication goals. Um, and there was a real shortage of speech language services uh, during pandemic time. Um, and we're just feeling um, a, a rebuilding and uh, the phone is, hasn't stopped ringing. We're getting a lot of calls for early intervention. Okay, we go over next door to our Child Care Institute. Um, we've been going there for a number of years providing push-in sessions for language literacy and articulation lessons and even sign language. Um, it's called Speech Friends. Uh, the children uh, love it. We get a lot of referrals uh, from children over in the um, Child Care Institute who are identified at risk for speech and language and hearing disorders. We screen regularly and we're definitely in a strong partnership with CCI. Um, we provide neurorehabilitation groups for our seniors in the community. We have active um, groups for people with aphasia. Um, we travel to local skilled nursing facilities such as Townhouse, which is right across the street, to do work um, in supporting uh, the residents' language and cognition. Something else we do for the community and to broaden experiences for our graduate students. Okay, the Long Island um, Consortium um, provides hearing screenings throughout the um, uh, metropolitan area in schools and Head Starts and Long Island schools um, for hearing screenings. That's for our doctoral students in um, uh, audiology to get their experience. Um, Long Island Consortium activities also include um, screenings and participation in activities at New York Special Olympics Annual Games. Um, one fantastic program that has developed over the years is global audiology. So the students and supervisors travel abroad to provide free hearing health care in underserved communities, uh, partnered with the Starkey Foundation. Here's some pictures of those trips and experiences. Um, to date, the um, travels included trips to Vietnam, El Salvador, Guatemala, Peru, Jamaica, Guyana, India, and the Philippines. Um, so it's really been a wonderful experience and partnership. Again, uh, pandemic has um, interfered with our functioning for these programs and uh, rebuilding is imminent. Okay, and that's all I have. I appreciate Teresa and Joe for uh, sharing the uh, statistics about um, how many people are impacted by the, the work of the Saltzman Center. And I think, you know, when we think about this idea of health and, you know, health in its many different aspects, right? Obviously speech, language, and hearing and mental health, but also reading and learning and literacy is also um, necessary for, uh, as a component for health as well. And so when we think about this, we also have to think about, you know, um, uh, going along with the theme of sustainability is the idea of the way that our environment also affects our health. And so uh, I'm gonna tell you the story about this project um, that I um, started working on um, way back in 2012. The project started with um, a, a, a pro uh, an actual research uh, endeavor that I was doing called Photo Voice. 
And photo voice is an approach to participatory research that means you work within a community, people um, go out and they take pictures, they take those pictures and then that's the photo, and then you sort through the pictures um, with the people from um, the group that you're working with and then they say what they see in the pictures and that's the voice. And the idea of photo voice is that it's meant for advocacy, it's meant to be able to identify the assets and things that need to be improved within a community. And so as I was working on this project of this photo voice project, which was actually originally um, focused on uh, issues around um, food and um, physical activity in the community of Roosevelt, as we were sorting through the pictures one day, which was something that we would do, and I, uh, I should say the uh, we is, I also worked on this project with um, teens from the Youth Run Farmers Market in Roosevelt. So that's who was taking the pictures and that's who we were working with. Um, one of the pictures um, is the one that you see here, and this was the, the comment that was made. Um, and as we started to have more of a discussion, it turned out that this used to be a commercial laundry. And one of the um, uh, students said that, you know, her mom used to work at this commercial laundry. Um, it had since been abandoned and not used in that way, but people had heard that it was something not right about it, that there was contamination on this site, um, and that people were worried about it. Um, on th that day that this discussion came up, one of our um, public health students also happened to be in the room, Sharice Carter. And Sharice um, uh, is a resident of Roosevelt, which is why she decided to come into this session. And when she heard about this site being a possible contamination site, first of all, she was familiar with it. Second of all, she also knew it was right down the street from an elementary school, um, right next door to a church, and wanted to know more about it. Um, and so what we started to do was to be able to investigate what is going actually going on with this site. So one of the things we recognized is that hidden in plain sight was this um, location that actually turned out to be, which originally was thought as a brownfield site. A brownfield site is an unoccupied site that's contaminated. So often um, former dry cleaners or gas stations are considered brownfield sites because of the you know, nature of the chemicals that are used in those locations. But just with a few clicks on the computer, we were able to find that this was actually a Superfund site. Um, and a Superfund site, as you can see by this definition, is um, sort of a, a, of a magnitude greater in terms of the level of um, contamination that was there. But what we also found interesting is that even though it was plainly labeled a Superfund site, there was not any activity that was sort of dedicated to being able to remediate or to clean up this site. Um, the site was currently being used as a woodworking site. Again, you can sort of see in this picture that it was also used for parking for school buses. Um, also that it, we um, were able to find out more about the owners of this site um, and to investigate further about, you know, did they know and what were they um, going to do? Um, and so the next step led to looking into and investigating what did the community know? Because this was how we found out about it. The community were the, was the one that identified, people within the community identified that this was a problem. So um, Charisse uh, took on this community-based participatory research. And so she conducted key informant interviews. She also conducted focus groups. And in those groups, uh, and she also reviewed documents. Um, and what in this process, what she was able to discover was, and so this is a picture from our groups. You can, you'll see Sharice in another picture, but she's up there um, with the piece of paper. But some of the things that we found out from, or that she found out from the um, focus groups were that people didn't know what a brownfield site was, that once they did find out that one was located on Centennial Avenue, that they were outraged that one existed in their community for so long without them knowing about it that the residents explicitly felt that their health concerns weren't taken seriously. I should also add by way of context that Roosevelt is considered a majority minority community, that the population is about 90% Hispanic and uh, African American. Um, and so um, uh, uh, Roosevelt, um, which is a hamlet, which we will talk also to, I think about um, in, in terms of the, uh, what a hamlet does is that it doesn't have the same sort of power that a village does. Um, or a town for that matter. And so all this gets into the details of Long Island and how it's sort of the jurisdictions work. But one of the things, this comment that they had that they felt that their health concerns weren't taken seriously is, was also reflected in the fact that in terms of politics, Roosevelt was often, their voices were not really heard. 
Um, residents also believed that how to address this, they thought that people should be scared <laughs> to be able to find out more about the co potential consequences, health consequences, um, in um, recognizing that there was a brownfield slash Superfund site nearby. And that they thought that spreading information uh, and uh, about these environmental injustices, uh, injustices and building community advocacy was, uh, was a key point. And so this led to the next step of mobilizing. Um, and so when it came to the idea of mobilizing, this is where Choice for All was also um, uh, engaged from the beginning, but sort of then worked with Charisse to be able to take over and to bring the different community partners together. I mentioned that there was a church next door, that's St. Paul's. Um, there were community forums that were then held about the um, Brownfield sites to be able to build um, advocacy to, to remediate that site. So now we are in 2013, and this was a community um, forum that was held to be information sharing. Um, the idea was to be able to explain what we found out from the background uh, information to, again, let people know, but also to hear from them what they wanted to be done. And here was the agenda that we see here. And you also see on the agenda that organizations like um, the RIP Sustainable Long Island, which was an organization that was dedicated to sustainability, um, also presented as well as the Nassau County Department of Health was invited to be able to present as well as the New York State Department of Health to be able to say what it is that's going on. So to their credit, they came and were able to sort of share with the community what those concerns were and what was going on uh, with that site. And here's a picture of the, uh, on the uh, that side of the uh, group that was there, and that is Charisse. Um, and she uh, also did this project as part of uh, uh, um, a program called Break the Cycle of Environmental Health Disparities, and so that was through uh, Emory University, and um, she presented uh, on, the, on the research that she did. I should also add that there was media attention that and media advocacy that was also part of this, um, uh, you know, uh, investigation and uh, attempts for remediation. Um, that not only were media becoming uh, aware of this, but then the ability to then do outreach with through community flyers to the community to let them know about what was happening, uh, mailings to um, local officials and to the church, local church and to the um, local businesses, and uh, again, to be able to let people know about what it was that was happening. So starting in 2014 is when some of the work actually began. Um, and so the advocation for the remediation and moving of the contaminated soil, because part of the work that preceded this was uh, a, a measurement of the contamination level. And indeed, um, because it was a, a commercial laundry, the solvents that were used to clean clothing had seeped into the groundwater, uh, not into the, into the soil and um, potentially into the groundwater. Um, this, the um, church next door had identified they often had meetings in their basement that several members um, came down with cancer and, you know, worried about the potential connection between the contamination and those results. Um, and so the testing was the first step to be able to determine in terms of the water and the soil quality. It was sufficient enough to be able to um, then start the next step, which was um, the was to um, host a public comment period. So you see I've sort of skipped all the way up to 2017. So as this was continuing, we see that this um, uh, the um, state did reach out and they held an event at the Roosevelt Public Library um, where they invited people to be able to um, uh, say what it was that they were going to be doing to address the level of contamination. In 2017, in April, that we see that this is what they um, decided to do in terms uh, with the community input to be able to make the decision about the um, uh, addressing the remediation for the contamination site. Uh, also, in 2017, here you see the comments that were submitted, um, and there um, the state is also reflecting those comments that the community then um, contributed to that. Let's fast forward to 2021, and um, the most recent update is that the site has been remediated. Um, the um, state um, was able to remove, um, I think you see in here, it's like something like 270 tons of the soil that was brought out and then replaced with fresh, um, you know, uncontaminated soil, um, and that the updates continue to be able to happen in terms of um, uh, declassifying this as a Superfund site. Um, and so what I want to sort of say as I turn it over to Sarah is to just sort of indicate with this that first of all, just how long this process took, but that this process would never have happened if the community involvement and the partnership also too between our academic, um, uh, you know, uh, pieces that we're able to bring were also came to bear. 
So I'm going to turn this over to Sarah to sort of talk about what is happening now. Thank you, Martine. Hi, everyone. So like Martine said, I'm a little tall. Okay. Um, my name is Sarah, and I am a parent organizer, lead parent, uh, senior parent leader for Choice for All, and our organization is located in Roosevelt. And like Martine just gave that phenomenal presenta presentation of how it all began, I'm going to talk about what we're going to look for in the future. And part of that is the Clean Air Community Initiative, and that's where we're engaging youth and parents as, reach, as their own researchers and advocates to improve the air quality um, for our community of color. I'm not particularly good. But. So what I want to tell you first is this is a very, this means a lot to me. I have five children, as you just heard, the ages uh, from 31 to 7, two of which go right down the block to California Avenue School, where um, Hofstra is also doing their work there. And my two children have asthma. And so air quality is always very, very important to me. Um, so just think about being in a, uh, I want to say, saying Roosevelt is diverse is kind of not even really diverse because we're majority black and Hispanic, right? And um, because of the poor income levels and stuff, we really didn't get much attention until someone like Martine came in and took the initiative with Choice for All and Hofstra's help to make this initiative happen. Um, so right now, we're, we are engaging in what we're calling the Clean Air Community Initiative. And that pur uh, purpose is to create a focused uh, participatory program to raise more awareness about our environmental injustice that's going on in Roosevelt. Um, our community health workers um, will be part of this project, and they will serve as coordinators that will oversee the logistics and administ administrative aspects of the program. Um, just ensuring that the eight sessions that we are going to be having through this program run smoothly. Um, we will be employing youth um, to do the work. And our youth are very important to us. They are the leaders of our community. Um, and to be, to be fair, um, they're the real advocates as far as I'm concerned. And I say that from having children ages 31. I call them children, but they're not. Um, and to see what the youth have done um, is just incredible with um, the work that they're going to be doing with this project and how excited they are with this project. Um, so how this project is going to work, and I don't know, I'm just going to, I'm speaking from the love of the passion of the work, so I may not be following this slide verbatim, so please excuse me if I don't, I'm not doing that. Um, but what it is, is um, we value our youth, so we will be paying them to do this work. Um, what's going to happen in Roosevelt, there will be devices planted, and I don't know if that's going to be shown in the next slide, but if it is, we'll just talk about that. Um, and what it is, is they're going to help to uh, help us to understand more and do more analyzing on developing the messaging of advocacy with our stakeholders within, within Roosevelt. Um, the partnerships, again, Hofstra University and Long Island Community Academic Research Partnership will serve also as research partners for quality assurance, data collection methods, and understanding the CBPR approach. And I had to look into what that is because acronyms are always a piece of work. Um, and that is basically community-based participating research. So what's going to happen is, and I don't really need uh, that uh, PowerPoint for that, there are going to be devices planted throughout um, different locations in Roosevelt. And what is going to happen is our youth are going to have uh, uh, something, a gadget like a cell phone. It, it, well, they will have a cell phone. On the cell phone, we'll have an app. And the app will be directed to this um, device. And when they're walking around in different parts of Roosevelt, they'll open up the app. And while they're walking around, the app will actually track the air quality. And it'll bring back that research. And after a period of time, we're not really sure how long this pilot program is going to last. I would say for at least a year. Um, we'll then begin to look back at this and research and gather that data and say, which area has the worst quality, which area has the good quality, which area has this, the not so great in between quality. Um, one thing that we do know is that the issue um, right now that we are seeing that is the biggest problem 
in Roosevelt is called the flying particulate matter, which bottom line is diesel. And if you know anything about Roosevelt, if you've driven through it, it's not that big, even though um, Fourth Street, it's, it's literally not that big of a town, but there's no greenery there. There's, there's no trees, and we all know that greenery produces oxygen. So if we don't have greenery, how can you have oxygen? If you don't have oxygen, how can you have good quality air? Let's be realistic. Um, and so we're hoping to figure out how do we fix that? And we're hoping that with the data that we collect, um, that we will be able to compare with other communities and sit down and say, okay, well, how do we make this change? How do we change this? How do we get better quality air? How do we make sure that our children are breathing better? And not just our children, our families. We have, you know, since COVID, the dynamics of what families look like. That's why I don't like being called a parent organizer anymore because the dynamics of families have changed. You have grandparents raising kids, you have aunties. Every, every child's uh, life, home life looks different, especially since COVID. So all I can say is that we are really gonna be doing our best to get the research that we need, collect the data, collect the data that we need to make sure that our communities are doing just as well as the more affluent communities, because we deserve that. And we need to start breaking down barriers and inequities and ensure that all children, no matter what zip code, especially those of diverse communities, have the right to breathe good quality air. Um, and I want to just go to the next slide because Hofstra has been such a big part of Choice for All. Again, I'm excited to say that I'm an alum of Hofstra. I got my bachelor's from here, but I have my master's from Adelphi, but it was a very good experience. I've, I feel like I've been to college all over, but being here and then to be back on campus, I haven't been here since 2001. I drive by it because my kids are down the block, but I haven't been on the campus. So it was really nice to see. Um, and as I'm walking through, I'm looking at all the greenery just in this one campus. And you have more greenery on this campus than Roosevelt has about the whole entire town. That's, and, th and that's a sad reality. Um, so, but I go back to Choice for All. Um, Choice for All um, is located in Roosevelt, like I said, and, and we're basically the only real CBO that pushes. I'm not gonna say that we're the only one, but we are the mo ones that are more active um, we have access to a lot of different resources, so we're able to do so. And with the help of Hofstra, we also did the food program that Martine talked about, with our youth took the um, lead on. And within that, which was amazing to me, if you look in Roosevelt, again, if you know the dynamics, we don't really have supermarkets. We have lots of liquor stores, not many. I don't, I think we have one bank, a McDonald's. Um, a pool, a park that doesn't really even look like a park to me, um, and tons of bodegas that did not sell good quality food. And with the help of Hofstra and Northwell Cohen Children's Hospital, um, we were able to get uh, the initiative to get, the, our youth literally went into the bodegas and got them to start to give organic food, sell organic food. Um, and that's such a big deal. Um, I want to say about 75, if I'm, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think 75% of the bodegas are now selling um, organic food and fruits, vegetables and fruits in our community. So um, I'm just going to end with that and just say that, you know, this is really exciting to see, and I, I can't wait to see how far it goes. Thanks so much, Sarah, and let's also, we got to do one here of course yeah hello we got a show yes yes so thank you so um, for our next um, uh, part of this presentation um, we're gonna bring everybody up to the stage and I'm going to engage uh, Michelle and Teresa in a conversation so we're gonna do a little transition here
thank you. So this is going to be uh, a conversation to engage uh, Teresa and Michelle about the work that you do at the Saltzman Center and really trying to help us um, connect some of the dots in terms of thinking about what are the um, uh, things that you've seen that have worked, the advantages, and also things that we can maybe get from this um, to be able, if we are interested in being able to be a more sustainable uh, service, what is it that we could do? So I want to start with the first question. This is for both of you. Um, how do students learn from your clinics? Can I go first? Sure. Go ahead. I think that um, it's important to remember that each of the clinics is connected to an academic department here on campus. So the students who come to me at the Reading, Writing, Learning Clinic are graduate students who have been preparing for their practicum. And through all their coursework, by the time they get to me, they are they're ready to take all that they've learned and to put it into practice. Now, when they arrive to me, they find a prof professional community of faculty, of um, literacy specialists who have their certification, who also work at the clinic as well as my own supervision, so that we can um, work with them to help them to act, put into action or to actualize the, the skills that they've been developing um, so that they are bringing to the children that they work with, we are working with um, children from the community, um, practice that's culturally relevant, practice that's um, theoretically grounded, that's based in assessment, and that values the learners. So, um, so that gives a you know sort of an introduction to how how do we um, work with them. I think it's also important to bring back to you introduced us as one of the five clinics of the Saltzman Community Services Center. Each of the five clinics um, has the mission, a tripart, um, tripartite mission of education of our students, service to the community, and research. And so in, in working to meet that mission, we are um, working to educate our graduate students. So. Yeah, um, like Michelle, our clinic, the Counseling and Mental Health Professions Clinic, train students to do clinical work in the areas of mental health. Um, under that umbrella, we have students who train in creative art therapy, rehabilitation counseling, uh, mental health counseling, and marriage and family therapy. So uh, they come into the clinic after doing you know, their initial classroom work and begin their, am I not loud enough? Okay. And they begin their uh, practicum with us at the Salzman Center, uh, seeing clients. And like Michelle said, we have the mission of training students uh, as well as we can with evidence-based practice approaches to mental health. We have people doing research. Uh, and we strive to serve the community, um, not just those who find us by coming to the Salzman Center, but also to reaching out a little bit broader. Like Wendy, um, our, our clinic has also been at California Avenue. and because of the pandemic and the restrictions, we haven't been back, and we hope to do that soon, but we've had art therapy students go in and work with small groups of children that the social worker at California Avenue has identified as needing a little bit more uh, support. Uh, and we've also run um, competent kids groups for attention skills and uh, social skills. So we haven't been able to do that at the school, but the students, the, the school staff is wonderful they will send out flyers to the parents, and it's a primarily Latinx and black community. So these parents often are looking for additional supports, may not have the economic um, uh, reserves to provide in certain ways, but we can at the Salzman Center provide these groups where the students are hands-on um, doing activities and really engaging the kids for a very, very low fee. Well, have you found, Teresa, that the, and Michelle, that the students react to that? I mean, you're sort of, we're sort of talking about them sort of in general, those students. Yeah. But like, can you tell, can put a little meat on that bone there? Sure. So I think uh, there's a distinct difference when students work in the local community, whether they go out or we're doing something targeted that we're bringing people to the Salzman Center for, where again and again we hear that it's a rich experience and they feel the, that there's just a connection with people. There's a level of appreciation they feel and a level of a sense that they are providing a service that might not otherwise um, be met. Mm -hmm. um, so there's definitely, because we have students come in and do their first year of clinical practice, and then some stay on to do their second, mm -hmm. their internship. And those students, 
when they speak to the incoming students at orientation, they talk about always the work they've done in the community. That is the thing that they highlight, the thing that they say they have appreciated and grown from. Uh, so I think as much as we serve the community, it really gives back to the students. I think for um, the Reading, Writing, Learning Clinic, many of the um, children that we provide services to or services to the community are our neighboring um, school, children from our neighboring school districts. And um, we work very hard to make sure that our, our program is affordable and accessible to anybody who's looking for um, to be part of it. Um, I think this summer, one of my graduate interns said it best when she was talking to the incoming group of um, graduate interns and she said, I just love the kids. And um, to me, I, you know, I just read that she realized the service that she's providing, that she's providing an opportunity where she knows that it's a safe environment for them, um, where they're just valued and appreciated who, for who they are culturally, linguistically, and behaviorally. So, and so that, that's so interesting that this, in both of you just talked of examples of students sort of telling other students mm -hmm. about like, here's what's the real deal in terms of what you're gonna get from us. Um, and so you both mentioned a little bit about the ways that you've reached out to the, or some of the ways that you reach out to local communities. But could you talk a little bit more? I know you both have some, um, sort of some details in terms of ways that you have done some of that local community outreach that really sort of, you know, goes above and beyond just sending out flyers. You can start. Well, okay, because so. Because they initially found us. Okay. Um, it's not always easy to um, bring in children from the community. It takes building relationships with the, um, the school districts that surround us, that we work with, that we invite to be part of our program. Um, over the years, the Reading, Writing, Learning Clinic has worked with donors um, and has several donor-sponsored programs. And um, because it takes relationships, there's been a period where um, there was a lot of change in administration. Some of the districts, I think you can say historically, a couple of the districts were um, at risk for um, being taken over by the state. And so there were these revolving doors. Um, and so I established a relationship with an administrator and then the next year they would be gone. And so it was getting very hard. It was getting very challenging to invite children to participate in these donor sponsored programs. And so I, um, reached out to someone on campus, um, Anita Ellis, and she came to meet with all the directors. Um, so where she didn't really have more relationships for me, wasn't able to help me build new relationships. Um, she then in Wellington um, was very instrumental to, yeah. to Teresa, so. Yeah, that, that um, created a bridge to uh, us meeting with a local pastor's wife who actually came to one of the director's meetings and, and said that she could not keep up with the notes that would get passed to her at Sunday service from people in the congregation who had questions, who needed help, uh, and she felt really exhausted and burned out by trying to sort of be there for her congregation, and she was the head of the women's ministry. So um, in brainstorming with her, she was saying, we need support, but uh, the people in our church congregation, generally the people in our community, are not gonna go to you so you'll have to come to us. And uh, it was an interesting experience because we didn't necessarily have a plan for how to go out in the community. We didn't have, we know now, if we have a grant-funded program, we have more sustainability. At that time, we, we didn't. It was just, there was a call for help that was, we couldn't not answer it. So um, actually it was, uh, the first time I went to the church, it was uh, at a women's meeting that the pastor's wife was holding. And she said, you have to come at my invitation. And once they see I've invited you and they get to know you, I think it'll be okay. Mm -hmm. And really, that's what had to happen. I, I had to get vetted sort of by the pastor's wife. I had to meet these folks and just um, be who I was and ask them what they needed. And that began a three-year uh, dedication. All I can say is, I'll say a little bit about so my background before coming to Hofstra, 
I'm also a Hofstra grad. I got my master's in marriage and family therapy here. And then I went out to work in the substance abuse community for many years. And I worked out in Bellport, uh, uh, out east on Long Island. And uh, it was also an area where it was primarily, it was a day treatment program for women who um, had come into a mandated treatment program mm -hmm. because of substance abuse. And it was a marginalized community. And um, a lot of what I loved about that work was I was able to take my education and bring it to people who really had sort of not had a voice and had been sort of on the fringes of, of society in a way and mm -hmm. been mistreated as far as I could tell. Um, so when the pastor's wife came to me and I met with that congregation, it felt like I could take something I loved, which was sort of mentoring the next generation mm -hmm. and marry that with doing some social justice work. Mm -hmm. So. Every Friday night, and I have to say that Dr. Scardapane, who's in the uh, audience here, who is the director of the um, psychology clinic at the Sultan Center, he and I would go to this Baptist church, and he would run a men's group. Mm -hmm. um, my, I had my students, who were the master's level students in multiple programs, running a mature women's group, a young women's group, a teen group. My teen twin daughters who were in high school were uh, babysitting for the little ones because they had to do community service. And some of these young moms could not come if they didn't have childcare. And we brought pizza, and we brought salad, and we brought pasta, and the food, and um, the fellowship that evolved was amazing. And so we did that every Friday night mm -hmm. during the fall and spring semester for three years. Mm -hmm. It was not sustainable, ultimately, because of politics in the church that started to move uh, the women's ministry away from our project. And we didn't have the funding. We didn't have a grant. Joe was using fundraising money for us to do that, to bring the food. Mm -hmm. And the food was a huge part of getting people there. Um, so we had a recipe, but we didn't have a way to maintain it. And we did try to get those folks who we'd made the connection with to come back and do groups at the Salzman Center that we could still offer it here mm -hmm. if we couldn't go there. But it wasn't, we didn't, we had a trickle of folks come in for services, um, but the group sort of disbanded and mm -hmm. it was really painful. Mm -hmm. um, but we've learned from that. So we can talk about that too. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. Wonderful. And so it seems that um, one of the things that I'm hearing is that, um, you know, the idea of going out into the community is not just like, hey, here we are, you know, kind of thing. You can't just roll up and sort of say, like, you know, we're providing these services. And that's also been my experience, too, is that showing up really is such an important and being consistent with yeah. that, right? Not necessarily going for what you want mm -hmm. from that situation. Yeah. Um, I brings me to my next question. Oh, yeah. What do you, I was going to ask about the barriers for local residents to getting the services. Um, so you mentioned, um, I don't know, what did you mention in terms of barriers? Uh, there's sort of like a perception barrier? Yeah, the, yeah I think there was a stigma uh, about mental health services, about going outside of your you know, family, talking about what's going on in your life with strangers or people outside of the family in terms of the mental health aspect. Mm -hmm. uh, I think there was also a sense that coming to Hofstra was not, it was not a place for them. Mm -hmm. they, they saw this as sort of uh, something out beyond their reach or, mm -hmm. or that didn't belong to them. Uh, even so though they were close by. Yes, even though really close by. Transportation mm -hmm. was often an issue. Um, I think childcare, if people wanted to come in for a group or they wanted to come for family therapy or couples therapy and they, they had little ones, what were they going to do mm -hmm. with their kids? Um, so it was very helpful that we brought you know, the services to them. So I think those things were definitely barriers from, from that I could see from that program. Yeah, for, for me, it's, it's different. So where um, the problem for um, being on campus is often transportation. Um, families like to bring their children to campus. They feel, the children love to say they go to Hofstra, um, that they believe that they're going to college and they're very excited about that. And we do, um, make sure that they know about campus. We take them on trips around campus. We sit in the um, sensory garden and we write in the sensory garden and so that they feel like they are part of part of the campus. Um, but in terms of barriers, I think that what you also touched upon and what I what talked about is um, relationships, building relationships and how they're so important, but also getting um, people to know that our program 
exists and that it's out there. And so, because we are so um, dependent on word of mouth. And um, when I had that, that period where I brought in Anita Ellis, at that time, I didn't have the administrators to say, there's this program, that's Hofstra, maybe your child would benefit from it. Um, I think at this point, I could say that we, I have strong relationships, but you know, there are people retiring all the time, mm -hmm. but it's a different place now, so. Just a shout out to Anita Ellis, who I think is like such a hidden gem of Hofstra. I mean, she's like a wealth of information. I think she's worked here like 30 years or something, but she's like so super plugged in to what's going on in the community. Which I think goes back to relationships. I mean, there's mm -hmm. relationships internal um, with my with my department, but also who else is on campus, as well as um, making relationships in the community. Wonderful. And um, what are your suggestions for making these services at your clinics more sustainable? We sort of hit upon a few different things, but maybe for you know the folks in the audience to be able to just sort of, um, from your experience, um, what do you what, what what should we do to make this something? Because it seems like there's clearly a benefit for the students, clearly a benefit for people in the community, um, but there are also things that are getting in the way. So what can we do? Yeah, I think all around resources are always a challenge, right? So, um, you know, one of the things that we did take away from doing the work with the church was that we probably needed some kind of sustainable funding beyond what Hofstra, I mean, Hofstra supports so much of our work in the sense that we can, we can serve the community for a very low fee. Mm -hmm. And even if people can't afford that low fee that's already set, we work with them to do a scholarship reduction. So we, you know, Hofstra does that piece. In addition to that, um, you know, there's one other program that's evolved recently. We have um, Hofstra's been the Salzman Center or the Counseling and Mental Health Professions Clinic has been written into a grant um, with Family and Children's Association, which is a large community service mm -hmm. organization um, based in Hempstead. Mm -hmm and they have a myriad of different programs, but the one that we are now working with is the nursery co-op. So that serves children from two to five years old whose parents are primarily Latinx, a lot of them new to the country, uh, new English speakers, uh, or not English speakers even, and the kids can come to the co-op for free and be in the daycare for several hours a day so the parents can take ESL classes mm -hmm. or look for work. Um, and so part of the, the piece of the grant that we're involved with that um, is the Mother Cabrini grant mm -hmm. for the co-op is that we, Hofstra, provides mental health services in the form of doing child mindfulness groups with the preschoolers. Mm -hmm. So we teach them how to regulate their emotions, how to practice breathing, mm -hmm. how to pay attention to what's happening internally, mm -hmm. how to slow down. Um, we know from the data that the earlier you get kids and really get them learning about slowing down and breathing and attention training, the better they do throughout mm -hmm. their lives in, with emotion regulation, with attention focus. Um, so we're providing that. We're doing art therapy mm -hmm. with the little ones as well. We do a group once a week. Um, we're doing a mommy and me creativity play uh, group so the mothers and the children can play together a couple times a month. We have a group for the older elementary school siblings of these uh, kids in the daycare that is similar to that um, group that we've done on campus, the Confident Kids group. Um, there's a lot, it, we, we just began working with the grant in January mm -hmm. 2022, so this fall we're really rolling out mm -hmm. full programming. But the thing that's making this sustainable, and it's already been, uh, it was a year grant that they're now saying they're going to give them three more years, us three more years. Uh, what's making it sustainable is that I can't be in 10 places at once, but the grant allows for me to have clinical supervisors on site when these programs are running to make sure mm -hmm. the students are doing the programming well, that they're learning, uh, that the families are served, that our relationship with the staff at Family and Children's mm -hmm. Association is strong. Uh, I have a student liaison who's able to be funded as a research assistant because we're doing outcome studies with the kids, pre and post tests before group and after about how they're feeling before and identifying their emotions after. It's really beautiful to see it evolving and the, the students have been on the front lines of creating the curriculum and implementing it and then they get supervision around it and then we tweak. Um, so I think it's all, it really always comes down to resources when you're talking about how do we go into a community and, and 
make a positive impact and not abandon them because that was something we heard at the church that when we first came, like you're one of many, You've, you're gonna come and you're gonna go and, mm -hmm. and that didn't feel great when, when that sort of played out. Yeah. Um, so I think for me the lesson learned is how do we really create a net that allows us to have support fully before we kind of go in and begin to do work that we, you know, it's really heartfelt mm -hmm. and great for the students because it, I think it really uh, gives them a sense that they are, what they're doing has meaning mm -hmm. beyond they just, can see it. yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think that what you bring up is imp that's important to um, the program at the Reading, Writing, Learning Clinic is how you listen to the community and you provide programming that they're looking for, that they need, as well as what your graduate students need. And, and so I think that that's important mm -hmm. for sustainability is making those kinds of partnerships. So. Yeah, and sustaining them, you yes, know, all the different things right. that it takes. Um, Sarah, I have a question for you. Oh. Um, why is it important for community members to be involved with Hofstra? So we talked about what Hofstra students and um, staff are getting from this idea, but from your perspective, um, why do you think it's important for community members to be involved with Hofstra? Okay, well, I have a lot of different ideas on that note. Um, Hofstra is clearly um, a well-known university and a lot of our community-based organizations when I listen to you talk about like you going into the churches, I'm sorry, because I take all that in and when I hear about all the barriers and stuff like that, I think it's important for them to know that there we can be on the same level. And I think that with Hofstra reaching out and getting involved in the communities is letting them see A, the type of support that they can receive from Hofstra, that Hofstra is open and wanting, not just willing, wanting, to be a part of the communities, to help as a resource. Um, and it also opens up to me, um, this may be going a little far stretched, but um, when I look at the communities that I serve, a lot of them don't even think of college, mm. you know? And here we have such a phenomenal, we have quite a few colleges just right in this one area. Um, and then to know that it's Hofstra, mm -hmm. you know? Um, I go back to when Jets was practicing on the Hofstra field, like mm -hmm. that was big for me. Um, so as far as for this community-based organizations, working with Hofstra and using, being able to use Hofstra as a resource, look at what Hofstra has been able to do for choice, with Choice for All. Um, getting good food into communities like ours that don't have access, and that's the key word here, I, wanted, I think, having the access to get things that other or, uh, communities take for granted mm -hmm. um, is big. And then on top of that, now with the new initiative with the air quality and stuff like that. So it's like it opens up. And I would want to say that nothing nothing happens unless you know what the problem is. Mm -hmm. And the only way you, you know what the problem is is if you go into the community. And the people that work best with the community are your community-based organizations. And another thing that you talked about that uh, strung out to me is when we talk about um, building relationships. Um, when I am out advocating, we always talk about building trust. We don't even talk about what we want to do first. We try to build a relationship to let you know that we're here, that we're trust. is trust. It's a safe space. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of time, that's big. We also talk about like what you do, um, making sure daycare is available. And I was laughing when you were talking about food because we do a lot of programs and once they know that food is there, so as long as Hofstra is involved and they bring food, people are going to keep mm -hmm. coming. Um, so yeah, I think that it's very, very important. Um, I'm very proud to say that I'm an alum of Hofstra and I'm very proud to be a part of an organization that works with Hofstra. It makes it even more passionate for me to keep going out and to keep bringing in more people from our community to know about the resources. But what I wanna say is um, my ask to Hofstra is get to know more of your community-based organizations. Don't just have them coming, looking for you. Mm -hmm. You reach out the same way. You guys found a way. Like, I thought that was very inspiring. I almost wanted to ask you what the church was, but I'm not going to ask you that. Offline. So, uh, mm -hmm. Offline, right. Um, because there's so much, and there's so much that can be done when you have relationships with stakeholders and 
families are not often looked upon as stakeholders, and they are the real stakeholders, and everybody else to me is the resource. That's mm -hmm. how I look at it. So if Hofstra, as well known as it is, as phenomenal as it is with all the resources that they have, and they produce phenomenal graduates, me one of them, mm -hmm. um, you know, to just keep doing the work that you're doing and then just keep reaching out. Instead of letting the CBOs come look for you, reach out and, and know your community. Mm -hmm. You know, Long Island is pretty big. Um, and I mean, I'm gonna speak mainly for Roosevelt, of course, but my children go to Uniondale School District and it was so, I'm so happy to hear about, like I can't wait to talk to Mr. Bruno to tell him um, that I met such great people who work with Cal, Cal Ave. Um, but we have phenomenal districts and houses like right in the center. And so if you reach out, there are tons of community-based organizations that really need the help and really don't know what it is that Hofstra has to offer. So I would, my task to Hofstra um, would be get out into the community um, because of the trust factor. They don't think that they're wanted. They don't think that they're cared about, clearly, as you can see about the situations that we're trying to help solve. So that would be my ask for Hofstra. Wonderful, thank you, Sarah. And so this is my last question for my colleague then. Um, as um, So since this is a presidential symposium and we have a relatively new president and provost who's here, um, uh, and Hofstra is looking to build on its strengths, right? We're in a process of sort of, you know, uh, reimagining what it is that Hofstra can do. Um, what would you suggest of how to expand sustainable community health services and research? So Sarah gave her sort of, uh, suggestion of what Hofstra can do. Uh, Wendy, any thoughts? In the past, uh, we had a really strong board um, that helped us with fundraising and support to run a lot of our programs. So I think with the universities helped to resurrect this a, a new board because our board was very, very old and uh, they're not with us anymore. Um, um, and that would help, or, or, or to have support for fundraising initiatives so we have um, the ability to do more. I have to just add that um, because of the pandemic, telepractice has really been a great thing for our clinics. Um, we're able to reach more people um, and we're able to give um, support to our non-ambulatory population, our elder population. Um, so support for infrastructure to continue that practice would be wonderful as well. Those are my last. Yeah, I, I agree with Wendy 100%. I think potentially a new board and, and some fundraising would go a long way for us because we've been able to, you know, the fundraising that was done in the past really sustained the program that we did with the church for a few years. Um, and I think it's difficult. I think we all have our heart in the work we do and in serving the community and the difficult piece is being able to do the outreach. Mm -hmm. So to have some more support in that way, to have a liaison even for the Salzman Center mm. that could work with the directors of each clinic and maybe pinpoint a certain community organization or a certain uh, schools or, or whatever to identify who, who might really need our help and how we might be able to bridge the gap. Um, I think that's, it's because there's only so many hours in the day. And so it's it's really difficult to do that piece as well as the training and running the clinics. So that additional staffing would be amazing. Mm, very good. I'm very dependent on some of my, or and very privileged to have some very strong donor sponsored programs. And you know I could use support in that, in cultivating um, more donors, um, more people who would be committed to the kinds of work that we do and the outreach that we have. Um, and I guess that would also come, as Wendy suggested, in, in reestablishing our board. And uh, one more thing uh, I want to add, uh, because um, of conditions for travel uh, opening up, um, re um, reworking our global programs. Um, our Long Island Audiology Consortium um, does wonderful work globally. Um, um, Dr. Murad, who is in the audience, is uh, working on a, a, a trip uh, globally um, to Jamaica in January. So that gives us more opportunities to you know, serve the greater community um, globally. Um, and, to, and the students love it. Um, so it would support education and training as well. 
And I think that that brings up just a good point about the board and sort of this sort of additional fundraising. And I'm sure, Sarah, I know that Choice for All also relies heavily on that as well. It's that Long Island is changing in terms of these donors like the Saltzmans, right, who were able to contribute their um, center. Um, you know, philanthropists of that generation really aren't around anymore. And people are looking beyond Long Island who, are, who do have the ability to, to donate, um, you know, in, in such a, a large level. So that's just my, you know, observation that makes it a little bit more challenging to get people to donate for local services. Martine, can I say something? Sure. Um, it's funny you say that because I uh, represent my organization not just on a local but on a state and national level as well. As you said, I work with um, the task force with Miguel Cardona. I don't know. Um, but I'm also part of a funder's toolkit, which is amazing. I swear, like, this is like deja vu because we just had this conversation earlier. Um, funders are really funny about who they fund. I know that sounds kind of... Um, and we always talk to them about like this power dynamic that's in place. Um, and when they want to help, they say they want to help community-based organizations, they say they want, but then they have so many stipulations mm -hmm. that they have in the grant that clearly the CBOs or even by Castro wouldn't be able to uh, sometimes meet. Mm -hmm. um, and we talk to them about being more realistic mm -hmm. um, and being more open on what they ask for when they grant. So I do a lot of RFPs mm -hmm. and looking at them, sometimes we laugh because we're like, yeah, okay, right. But then they're so quick to just give money away, but then they don't even know who they're giving the money to. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that we did, and, and this is looking out and seeing what Hofstra does, like for me to do an RFP for you, not only do I want to read your, your grant, but I want to interview you. Mm -hmm. I want to make sure that what you're saying on paper, you're just as passionate about as when I speak to you. Mm -hmm. So I want to say that if uh, Hofstra, you know, looking for more funding and more resources, think about that and then think about when you're talking with funders what they're looking for. Um, we're three years in with doing this toolkit with them. Um, and actually, we'll be in Austin two weeks. For them to invite a CBO is big because mm -hmm. they've never, ever done that. So we're working on that and just knowing, again, to me, that Choice Hofstra works so closely with Choice, knowing how much help that we need. Because technically, Choice, yes, clearly Roosevelt is our main uh, community, but we service every uh, zip code within Long Island. Um, and that's our goal, to be able to help every single zip code in Long Island. And that's such a great point, um, to Sarah, is that for us who are looking for funding, it's like we have to have something to talk about, right? And like you said, something that we're passionate about. So sort of like, you know, which comes first, you know, in terms of doing that, but certainly being able to build in the ways that we can, being able to extend in the ways that we can, um, given the resources that we have and continuing that work, I think is really, you know, can speak volumes to be able to then build and ideally to be able to have funders recognize. Um, the, the value of this, and especially, you know, um, to, to see how it benefits students and the community as well. So we have um, maybe one minute left. If there are any questions out there, I strategically sort of set it up like this just in case there weren't <laughs> any, but you have to use the mic. Sorry, Joe. So I actually don't have a question. I just wanted to say two quick things. <clears throat> Melissa Fitzgerald is in the audience here. She is our boots on the ground in California Avenue. Oh, so I just really? wanted to recognize her. Hi, I just got I got to know you. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the work she does. And the last thing I just want to say is that for myself, I think for the rest of us, when we do this work, the cultural humility that we actually mm -hmm. experience and pass on to our students is invaluable. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's a really, really important part of this whole process. It's a great point, Joan. Just the idea of cultural humility is sort of in contrast yes. to cultural competence, right? Is this idea that there's so much that we don't know about different cultures and that the best way to do it is to listen to people and to just be present and to ask them. And um, I, I appreciate you bringing that point up, Joe, because I think that those are the kinds of skills that students in these fields are clearly going to be able to mm -hmm. need and to, be, um, and to continue to learn. So mm -hmm. what better way to do it than to sort of put it right in front of them? Okay, I think that's it. We're done. Thank you. Thank you.